want to make a couple of announcements before we move into our program as usual. And one of them is to say, you may have noticed on your way in that there is some fabulous artwork in the windows of the uh, IAS. And there will be an event tomorrow um, connected uh, to, that, to that artwork. It's uh, Omenahe, I'm not going to say the Spanish right, never mind. I get nervous and then it's even worse. But it's a tribute to he Jesus, a uh, graduate student at the University of Minnesota who is unfortunately no longer with us. But um, Jesus Estrada Perez is the, the artist whose work is being featured and there will be an opening reception uh, in memoriam uh, to him tomorrow afternoon from 4 to 7 p.m. in the Founders Room uh, on the other side. So this room, but on the other side uh, of, the, of the building on the second floor. So 4 to 7 p.m. tomorrow and in the meantime admire the artwork. Um, as most of you probably know, we're also having a um, event formerly known as a happy hour, but not anymore, uh, <laughs> for the IAS friends and family upstairs on the fourth floor, on the fourth floor, sorry, in the gallery adjacent to the Best Buy Theater immediately after Thursdays at four, so come and partake. Um, and then next week, Thursdays at 4 is the last one of the semester, and our speaker will be Deirdre Lynch from the English department at Harvard University, and she'll be talking about what is, was a book, some answers from the Romantic period. So uh, I encourage you to come. So today's talk is sponsored by the Agri-Food Collaborative. I, I don't know if they know they volunteered to co-sponsor this, but they, but they did. And, uh, and the Institute on the Environment. And it's titled, Exploring Food and Agriculture Across All the Usual Boundaries. And our, our um, two uh, presenters, panelists, uh, conversationalists, um, our Valentine Kudju, who's the director of the Environmental Studies Program at Hamlin University, and Nick Jordan, who's a professor of, um, in, I have to look at my notes to get titles of departments right too, gosh darn it, a mm -hmm. food um, genetic, genetics and plant agro agronomy? Agronomy and plant genetics. Oh, <laughs> uh, oh, and now I find it in my notes, agronomy and plant genetics. So anyway, rather than give you the lengthy and, and illustrious academic pedigrees of Valentine and Nick, I thought I'd focus a little more on uh, the ways in which uh, the work that they've been doing that demonstrates their interest. And just say first that both of them are currently members of the IAS Advisory Board, and yes, we do know how lucky we are. Um, so Valentine is a co-convener of the IAS Agri-Food Research and Creative Collaborative, and she's also worked with Peter Shea, the, the um, creator of the Band of Minerva television program, on a food storytelling project um, in southwest Minnesota, and she's also co-taught a faculty seminar titled Ta uh, Talking Over Food Abundance and Scarcity in the 21st Century. Nick Jordan, who uh, has also co-taught a faculty seminar under that same university symposium on abundance and scarcity, and his was titled New Curriculum for Sustainability. Um, so if you want to find out more, all of these things are available. You can find links to all of these things I've just mentioned from the IAS website. So for the past eight years, although Valentine said she actually met Nick more than 10 years ago when she was uh, still a postdoc at Yale, Nick and Valentine have worked together and with their respective communities of practice to integrate tools for communicative practice and systemic understanding. And that's largely been in relationship to complex food society and environment relationships. And Valentine's current work includes field, involves field guides that support people sharing food experiences and expertise and building access to land for food production, while Nick is centering on building a new agricultural bioeconomy in South Central Minnesota. So you might notice that you're kind of arranged in a different way today. And what we really hope this will do is lead to much more cross-conversation than we often have at the end of a program. And to that end, 
I'm both going to ask the first question in advance of the presentation mm -hmm. and introduce to you our designated intensive listener, Bill Mosley, sitting right here. <laughs> Bill is an IAS fellow and also a professor of geography at McAllister College, and his new book, Land Reform in South Africa, Uneven Transformation, just came out last week. Uh, and this week, if you look in the banner of the IAS, on the IAS homepages, you'll see a link to um, the interview view that uh, Bill did with PRI's The World yesterday on Can There Be Clean Philanthropy. Mm -hmm. So Bill's role is to make sure that we're not dropping any themes and, uh, and, and to encourage that cross-conversation among us all and not just our two panelists. So the first question that I'm going to seed is, I just said that you talk about um, uh, you you work with your respective communities of practice. So I want to ask you to talk more about what your communities of practice are and how you're defining them after you finish making your presentation. Thanks. Great. Super. Well, thanks a lot, Jennifer. It's, it's great to be part of this. Um, I'm going to lead off what uh, Valentine and I are hoping to do is to put out some perspectives reasonably quickly so that the exchange that Jennifer was just talking about can actually happen. And being academics, we're you know, extremely bad at uh, putting anything out reasonably quickly, but we'll try. So um, I'm going to talk about work that I'm doing that is intended and striving to cross some, um, some sort of boundaries and um, prominent gaps uh, in uh, our societal engagement with food and agriculture. And then Valentine will talk about her boundaries, spanning efforts as well. And this all, like I said, will, we hope, happen pretty quickly. And so we can have um, some comments from Bill, perhaps, and thank you for being here with me. And, uh, you know, the, again, the discussion with Jennifer and Visions. So, uh, and, and I'll, I'll just say that a significant part of the community of practice for this project is listed here. Chris Slaughterback is a um, environmental planning person at the Humphrey School. David Pitt is a landscape um, architecture and landscape ecology person in the College of Design. And David Mulla is a um, soil scientist and um, hydrologist who studies soils and how water moves in landscapes. So we've been, we've, there are lots of other collaborators, but those are some of the main folks. So let me tell you what this community practice has been up to. We've been wrestling with the notion of um, so-called sustainable intensification of agriculture, which is a term that has been used for about 10 years. It's very contested, like anything related to sustainability, I suppose. What that could or would or should mean is very contested. But um, many of my colleagues, and I guess the sort of progressive agriculture world, hate this term and refuse to use it and consider it to be entirely co-opted by various kinds of greenwashing, but uh, we receive, refuse to kind of concede it. So sustainable intensification is the idea that agriculture needs to produce more, which is usually understood in terms of kind of uh, commodities of agriculture, and combined with the idea that there needs to be more resource conservation, quote unquote, in the process. And Lately, the, the sort of challenges of coping with global change has been added to that definition. Where we start to run into boundaries is that uh, the main critique of the idea of sustainable intensification has been that things like food justice, food democracy, food sovereignty, all those things have tended to be left out of the conversation. And the critique is that any kind of if sustainability has a social component as well as other components, any kind of social sustainability of, of agriculture has to deal with these social issues. So we're trying to do that. And so I guess that counts as a certain amount of boundary crossing. And we're trying to do this in the context of a, a big project that we call the Forever Green Initiative. And the Forever Green Initiative is really all about uh, the agriculture of the Midwest. A whole lot of it looks like this. And what this is meant to depict is a whole lot of corn in a field. 
And there's lots and lots of reasons to hope for a, a transformation or a diversification of Midwest agriculture to look something like this. And in particular, um, if something like this could happen, uh, we feel we might move quite a bit towards this ideal of uh, sustainable intensification, including possibly the social part. So uh, for Evergreen, and there's a nice collection of YouTube videos produced by graduate students mainly associated with it at that um, place, if you want to look at it. But it's, um, again, again, it's very consciously a vehicle by which we're trying to move forward with this project of sustainable intensification in a way that really deals with the social dimension of it as well. And a big part of what we're about is something that we have started to call sustainable commercialization of new crops. Uh, one of the issues with going from that kind of landscape to this kind of landscape is that a lot of the, uh, the new kinds of plants or new kinds of crops that we might want to grow are not necessarily uh, developed genetically and therefore don't necessarily function in a way that, that is really viable. So part of the Forever Green Initiative is all about sort of producing this portfolio of new crops. And just briefly to mention an example of that. So a bunch of us are currently working on trying to turn a weed, this thing called field pennygrass, which is found all over the world, into a new um, crop that produces oil. And what's interesting about pennygrass is it's super hardy. It survives the Minnesota winter just fine. So you plant it after corn and let it grow on to the spring and then plant soybeans into it and then come harvest the soybean of the pancreas while the soybeans are just getting going. It has all these advantages. It has some uh, potential issues like uh, comes from a weed, might it in fact turn into a weed uh, that might be more serious than the current version of pancreas is. And there are all kinds of interesting questions that uh, get us into the whole social sustainability domain. Like, should we use the new technologies of genome editing that uh, you know, are really quite different from the old genetic uh, modification techniques, but, but are still manipulations of genomes with kind of unknown effects? Should we use those sorts of things to rapidly produce these, uh, these crops, the new techniques are arguably, as far as we know, way faster and way cheaper than the previous techniques. And so there's a certain, if we need diversification really quickly, then wouldn't it be great to use these really rapid techniques? But on the other hand, what are we really doing? And so we're trying to you know, not avoid those, those difficult questions, but to actually take them on in the context. So I guess that makes the Forever Green Initiative into sort of a transdisciplinary project. And so I guess that's another set of boundaries that we're trying to span as well. And what, uh, what I guess I mean by transdisciplinarity is taking on you know, very normative questions or purposive questions that really concern what are our ultimate intentions. You know, diversification, in a sense, is, a, is really a, an ends to, uh, a means to an end. What is that end? Um, so essentially, what kind of agriculture do we, you know, recognizing that we is problematic, do we want, and how can new crops that the Fur Green Initiative uh, is producing, how could they get us there? How do we, how do we link up asking those difficult, normative, purposive questions and tying those to science and innovation? How do we ensure that, uh, you know, difficult but critical things like the democratic nature of the, the processes by which we do or do not introduce a new crop to a region um, in a way that addresses sustainability. That's what we mean by sustainable commercialization. How do we do that? So to the extent that we're actually wrestling with those sorts of projects, we are trying to be transdisciplinary. And um, so, uh, you know, to be a bit more concrete about that, various kinds of sort of humanities or humanistic ways of knowing we're very much trying to, to bring into the, the work. Um, so this emerging field of design thinking, and I'll show you some of that in action in just a second. Other techniques such as so-called public narrative and scenario planning are all things that we're doing 
in which we are trying to, first of all, link up normative, purposive, deliberative kinds of questions to the science and innovation. And our goal really is essentially to think about citizenship and, pol and politics and how these um, you know, need to transform just like plants need to transform in order to actually realize a landscape that looks something like this or function something like that. So we're, that's the kind of boundary crossing that we're working on. And I want to finish up by just focusing in on this idea that we're using design thinking and talk to you guys about the notion of geodesign, which is a, a, a sort of a new term that describes applying uh, design practices to relatively large pieces of terrain, and uh, a version of it that we're trying to work out, which we call collaborative geodesign, that is essentially intended to bring a lot of different folks together to really work out scenarios for how a landscape could be different, and to discuss how economy and society and community might an environment might be different if that landscape were different, and you can see some photographs from our project. And um, I, I think that's I think that's enough. I was thinking about showing a video to, to show you this sort of thing in action, but I in the interest of time, I think let's just say it to Valentine. And let me fold her presentation. You can savor your moment of respite here because I'm about to fly you through what the next time I see you will hopefully be something I my web skills have increased to actually show you live on the internet, but they're not currently there. Alright. And you think when I look at these geodesign screens that so Nick and I worked together for three years in the prior project that led to that. And I think, oh, after that I should have better technology skills. In any case, so I'm Valentine, and I'm really grateful to get this chance to work through thinking about what we've been trying to do with students and scholars in the food and agriculture movement work over the last few years. And a lot of this has been through IS, so this is a great place to recap it. And a lot of what I think about is how learning and scholarship work in the food movement, kind of the education branch of the food movement. So I, I think a good overview into the kind of approach that we thought would be good to contrast um, is a project I've been working on, um, Field Guides to Food Systems. And it's otherwise known as Eating Together, which is the name of the podcast version of this that will go live at the beginning of next year, Share, Eat, Learn, and Act. And it's a project that's been supported in addition to the IIS and the Institute of the Environment, the Global Spotlight Project has funded us to create a project on popular food literacy, um, where we focus on how do people feed each other, partly in counterpoint to the Minnesota narrative of how we feed the world. So this question of why did guidance and orientation seem called for seems like a good place to start. And the good food gap in my field is often defined as the distance between people's attempts to secure healthy food for themselves and their families and people's attempts to make a good livelihood growing healthy food. And that gap in between is something people spend a lot of time and energy talking about. But as a scholar interested in how people negotiate things that will play out as socio-spatial relationships, part of what has been important is the distance that that communication measures, that people are so not even asking the same questions that, that the majority of the public discourse that I witness never gets to a place where people have shared priorities or even shared approaches. It tends, and genetic modification, as Nick tentatively was saying, you know, this, this question, do we use genomic sequencing? It blows up whenever we talk about it. We can't get to the interesting or important or political questions. So how do we scaffold that for people? A bit? So I'm coming in a context I work mostly around access to land for food and also increasingly around questions of race and power. And I come from a perspective of environmental justice and political ecology. And in the time I've been in Minnesota, I realized 
the political ecology of agricultural ecosystems has become more of a field, political agroecology. And these happen to be the last reading and the next reading in January of the Agri-Food Collaborative. So, so we are thinking a lot about these questions, how do people frame this stuff. So I'm going to spare you the, the lots of details of this because we'll have time for discussion. But the basic gist is that we felt it was important to bring more scaffolding into conversations around food that were about the process mechanisms that were involved in any kinds of conversations and knowledge sharing around food. And to really emphasize that there's this constant iteration of exploring topics and negotiating them and institutionalizing that, however informally, and then re-exploring and renegotiating. And that three-part process ends up really highlighting three fairly significant areas of challenge. One is that it's hard for <coughs> academics to allow people to tell their own stories. Um, and it's even harder for us to figure out how to encourage people to build their own analyses. So we have a lot of skills that we can bring into conversations, but we're like, maybe I know the answer um, all the time. So, so witnessing that there are already a lot of forms of knowledge, which everyone has expertise around food, it's one of the things that makes it so fun to study. But then figuring out how to negotiate, how to bring together those different forms of knowledge, a lot of things people know about food are probably incorrect from many perspectives, um, but they probably still have something interesting about them, and figuring out how to, how to negotiate that, and then to evaluate the effects of what's happening and build support structures that keep people wanting to work together. So that's kind of the basic framework. The context, and we'll get into this more as I said, I'm increasingly working with the Twin Cities Agricultural Land Trust, the Urban Farm and Garden Alliance, and the folks over at Five Town Farm who have been connected a lot to Safety Jones and Create the Community Meals. So a lot of groups that are probably one of the main things they have in common is it's work done by people who feel like they've been left out of a lot of the knowledge creation around food and agriculture that tends to get institutionalized in the academy. And they also tend to be uh, largely interested in the agricultural practices of people who have been dispossessed of their land. But we're working in this really interesting context. I'm going here to Homegrown Minneapolis, having an open house, and we have this idea, it's strangely nerdy in its detail, of keeping more soil nutrients in neighborhoods. So we have this uh, agroecological ambience that is unusual. So we've this, I have a group that I work with. A lot of it has been student and community fellows who come together and share knowledge and try to, to make it into what we have been thinking about as learning modules that are loosely tied together from a multi-nodal field guide. So, for example, from the Twin Cities Agricultural Land Trust, thinking about equity in urban agriculture, um, students thinking <coughs> about urban agriculture, uh, a lot of research projects that have been done, so I'm just going to kind of flip through some of these. What we've been doing is collecting all of the community-engaged research projects that have lived in people's binders or on defunct websites and aggregating them. Many of you have heard me talk about this, so we have what we think of as the baseball game, <coughs> who can fly when. And then what I think is really interesting and want to zoom in a little bit more are these kind of, how well do these sources of food knowledge do different things? And this is directly pulling from the project that I worked on with Nick, where we're asking these questions, how well do different sources of food knowledge engage an adequate range of perspectives, translate between perspectives, address conflict across perspectives, generate useful information for those affected? So this was based on a few years of synthesis of people who are practitioners working at these boundaries and trying to give people ways to coordinate I love this definition. So boundary objects that you could use in knowledge objects that allowed you to coordinate your conversations without consensus. So we don't have to agree to be able to talk. So then I just wanted to, to give a really brief overview. And it's awesome. So, so I realized the key example I've been using is actually Nick. Um, so this worked really well. So students have been gleaning often from IAS or from the Bad of Minerva, tend to be hour long or kind of roughly hour-long reports, things that come up all the time when someone's having a conversation, you're like, oh, you should watch the da 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 But it's an hour-long, people often don't. And so we've been 
creating linked tables of contents and then editing those down to 20 minute versions with a little two minute trailer. So that in the moment of conversation, you can say, you should watch this two minutes right now and you can go back and see what it's about and watch more of it later. And then trying to insert those into moments where people would like more information. So here on campus, a student, Maria Frank, last year, built this overview for the Real Food Challenge as they were negotiating with University Dining Services. And actually plugged in some of these details, so with the little baseball card and some reports that had been done to be able to give people a little more depth. These are topics you think are interesting and here's a lot of work from your communities and where you can see how people have vouched for whether they were useful for them or whether they were felt really like they were just a particular audience or how did they deal with conflict. And then we can try to integrate some evaluation of how that gets used. So I'm just going to have a very quick end of the way we've been using this is trying to insert it into lots of different contexts where we think people might be willing to do the nerdy work of thinking about how to hold accountable different approaches to knowledge. So if you say, for example, I don't talk to those people. This was a conversation I cannot tell you the number of times I've heard. It's like, they're dirty hippies. They're evil capitalists. It's like, well, what does their evil capitalist approach bring? What does the dirty hippiness approach bring? Like, what is it that is either compelling or scary about that? And how, what are the guardrails we want to put in place to have that conversation go well? So we've been doing tours, and we have games at the state fair, and many of you have participated in the uncomfortable dinner parties. And part of where we've been leaving that is all these little documentations get put into the field guide, we create translational glossaries and some of this more metadata that's about how we share food knowledge. And I will leave it there for the conversation. Hey, do you want to come up and... Sure. has been small data. And I talked a bit about the specific groups. Um, but a lot of these are people who work in the progressive agriculture domains that Nick's worked in. A lot, one of the first places we went was the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture. Because they had decades of binders on their shelves of really interesting projects people remembered being part of. But then we have, I think, probably married that to some degree with people who are interested in critical domestic development. So. There's an agroecology and the right to food community who are thinking about how, how do different ways of food knowledge matter differently in the way that, say, food research gets implemented. And a lot of the people, so if big data is huge data sets controlled centrally, small data is kind of populist data sets scrappily put together, people trying to figure out how to network them. But a lot of the people who control that knowledge are people students have been trained to ignore. It's knowledge that is not the kind of, it's not peer reviewed. So, so a big piece of the community of practice we've been trying to build with this is an extended peer review. Like the idea of what would it mean for peer review to happen outside the academy? Who's, who's vouching for counts and how, to, how do you make that accessible and transparent? Well, uh, what I would say is that in this Forever Green Initiative thing that we're trying to get off the ground, it's a really large group of people, and uh, it would be um, it would be wrong to say that we uh, we have all ninety of us <laughs> have have had deep conversations with each other about what we're trying to do. But um, the, um, I would say that uh, we have on the one hand tried to use sort of classic interest-based organizing. So the Forever Green Initiative has a lot of relationships outside the university. 
and those have been built, you know, on with the use of a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, trying to um, essentially interest a wide range of folks in our project on the basis that it could be helpful to their project. And we also have had a group of graduate students who are being supported by work in the Forever Green Initiative, and that group has been um, has evolved into a kind of um, kind of thinking group that tries to advance ideas. Uh, for example, this idea of sustainable commercialization emerged out of a graduate student group uh, that met over a number of years. Um, so. Jennifer, those are some things that I would highlight. The floor is open. So, um, I'm assuming that both of you share this kind of normative belief that it would be better if um, communities variously defined were better fed, had better nutrition, that agriculture and food-based <coughs> livelihoods were more viable and that in the process of producing and consuming food, we want to take better care of the planet. And your hypothesis seems to be that these boundaries are getting in the way of achieving that end. Whether they be boundaries between different disciplines or boundaries between kind of formal knowledge systems and informal so, could you talk a little bit more about those boundaries, you know, why they're there, why they're a problem, and maybe the challenges you've, an example of a challenge you've encountered trying to work across these boundaries. Why don't you go first? Sure. That's funny because the main example that keeps coming to mind is actually about your project. Um, so, I'm not sure that I would I agree with almost 80% of what you said. I'm not sure that the boundaries themselves are the problem. I think the boundaries are there partly because there are many different knowledge cultures, and I think it's valuable to have many different knowledge cultures. Um, and I have a lot of ambivalence about, I, I often, many of you have probably heard me talk about boats rather than bridges. And I don't think that breaking down boundaries is necessarily good because that breaking down often comes from the center and tends to lead to the extinction of knowledge cultures that are valuable. And valuable not from the center, but for the people in them. And maybe if they were valuable from the center, it would be for, for reasons that we should be cautious about. Anyway, I think, especially as a scholar, part of what compels me is giving people a, a ability to navigate those boundaries better. And I think the better there normatively is to recognize you've hit a boundary. And I think so two examples that come to my mind are one is when I worked for a long time in southeast Minnesota, which was the, where I ended up realizing a lot of this stuff would be useful. And it was a group of people who were trying to come up with speaking points to support local food. And their ability to gain momentum in that was constantly hampered by the same mechanism that brought people in. So it was during everyone reading Michael Pollan, and people would come in and say, stop everything, corn syrup, bad, everything must stop, and we must grapple with how bad this is and how, how lied to we have been about what is in our food. And, and that learning process was a useful one, but it was also extremely disruptive. And so it made me think, you almost wanted some again, I'm going to use this metaphor of guardrails and the on-ramp, so that people could, could not be corralled, but could have a sense of, oh, as I come into this topic, look, people are working on this thing. So, so this is part of why I'm thinking about orientation, like a field guide. So it's not that the boundaries are not there, or shouldn't be there, but that maybe they could be navigated with more awareness of what built those boundaries in the first place, and what function they're a very ecological understanding of this. But the example that came up for me this summer, I was down at the Agroecology Summit in Wyndham, and there was someone giving a talk from the ARIS on um, grain, 
grains, ancient grains. And I asked about the grain that Forever Green has been working on, and you know, pulled, just just and a very simple question about the like some pieces of biology of this grain. And the person giving the talk went off for a half hour angrily about how this should never be funded, about how if if nature had wanted there to be perennial food plants, there would be. And everyone sitting around me is like blueberries. And like, they're coming up with other perennial food plants. But it was such a good example of the way that the scholar in the room often shuts down the conversation um, by not being aware of what, like, like there's clearly a boundary that made him really angry. People came up to me all weekend and were like, what was going on there? Why was he upset? Why did you ask that question? I was like, I really wanted to understand the difference between C3 and C4 carbon. I don't know what happened. And maybe you have more insight into what that boundary is. No. <laughs> Not for the moment, at least. Yeah. Uh, Nick, you spoke about alternative crops, and I'm interested in that. I have my farmland and my nephews, and they don't want to grow soybeans more than every fourth year. Uh, they said the yield drops too much. So you're constantly looking for something else in there to grow. If you could talk about that a little more. Well, yeah, thank you. There are all kinds of things that could be grown. The, the issue is. Um, being able to sell them in a way that leads to a livelihood, obviously. And uh, so uh, that's why this idea of commercialization is so important to us. So universities have, uh, land-grant universities have had alternative crop research programs, you know, ever since there were land-grant universities of agriculture. And the, the the way that that has been done has been to find crops that possibly could be grown. So that would then involve saying to your family, so here's a list of things that you could possibly grow. And, you know, obviously that is not going to, um, no one's going to bet the farm on that sort of, uh, on the basis of that kind of information. So um, we're trying to identify things that um, we and, and lots of other people are trying to identify things that can be grown. So there's this whole, a lot of people are focused on this kind of uh, objective of finding a third crop, quote unquote, to go along with corn and soybean in the Midwest. And, uh, you know, that's one of the, the appeals of this penny press thing. So specifically for your situation, you know, I, I guess my response would be extremely contingent. You know, maybe they want to get into the cattle business and get into grazing, which can be very profitable in the right situation. Or maybe they um, would want to start growing some sort of high-value perennial like hazelnuts, or there are all kinds of fruit crops. So there's all kinds of things. But, you know, in, in candor, most of them are economically marginal. And so that's one of the things that we're that's one of the boundaries that we're trying to span, essentially, is the, the big gap between um, you know, an option for diversifying Midwest agriculture and something that actually has some legs and, and could diversify Midwest agriculture. So can I, can I ask you a question back? How do they go about the process of trying to figure this out? Who do, who do mm -hmm. they look to for information and, and um, uh, I did basically start out our com the combines have yield monitors uh -huh. on them. So what's the yield if you have corn beans, corn beans, which they really don't have that. But then you can go corn sugar beets, beans. Well now you have two years and what is it when you only have beans every three years? And then they can go corn sugar beets, sweet corn beans and have three years in between. And basically, to get the most yields, you have to go to five years. Uh, they're, they're satisfied with once every four years, but uh, and, and then after five years, they really haven't seen a gain after that. And it's mostly it's called nematodes mm -hmm. in the soil from soybeans. So, but they're really relying on their their own experience and knowledge. Um, my nephew's also a crop insurance agent. So he sees other people's yields, yeah. um, and does the extension service and that right. kind of thing do they come in? Uh, they do uh, studies, also. So so there is a variety. They mostly rely on themselves, talking to the neighbors, mm -hmm. 
elevator. The yeah. elevator is the place to go and talk. Yeah. <laughs> sort of like I, a water I, cooler. I will bring in the totally non-academic aspect. Um, the, I grew up in a small town in Nebraska. And, you know, from a farmer's point of view, it makes sense to look at what produces the best. You know, what will work the best in this particular area. Um, and that is a very strong incentive. You want to find something that's going to do the best in the land you have. I don't, back years ago, there was no, part of the GMO thing is these two, two, as you said, these two communities have no, have no good way to talk to each other. You know, the, both are, both are mo motivated by good intentions, but they haven't, the idea that maybe some, someone would bring in the thought of, oh, for a community to have access to this might make a decision, might help make a decision on what I plant, not just, you know, what the, what the guys at the elevator say. Well, so, one of the best talks I've heard here was Glenn Stone asking what would a poor person's GMO look like? And it was a wonderful thought experiment on what are the claims that are made and the ways that people are riled up all around that conversation, but then marrying it with what I think is, is you know, as you mentioned, this livelihood question behind it, that, you know, what has driven people off the land? I mean, here in Minnesota, I have yet to come up with a good way to have this conversation well, but it, it hangs over the land that this is stolen very recently, and many people still suffer because they are here and not able to access their land. So especially working in an urban land trust, this question keeps coming up. How do we make land accessible to people who want to grow food without reappropriating that land? And part of me thinks it can give people an even more uncomfortable conversation. Maybe that makes genetic modification seem easy to discuss. And then maybe you build your capacity and then get to colonialism. Before, Amy, you had your hand up a bit. Okay. Yeah, um, well this is sort of moving from the literal ground level to something I don't know if more abstract is exactly right, but um, picking up on your image of um, boats, not bridges, um, I'm not sure exactly where you go with that, but one where my mind went with that was that when you're on a bridge, you're on a bridge, and what the bridge is going over is fairly irrelevant. Um, you're just getting from one place to another, and your only real location is on the bridge. But when you're on a boat, you're on the boat, but you're also on the river. Um, and it makes a difference that you're on the river. You're you know, dealing with the currents, and there's all kinds of different things. So the, the space that you're traversing is materially real when you're in a boat in a way that it's not when you're in a bridge. And that creates problems. I mean, you know, unless the winds are really, really high or it's sleeting or something, you know, the bridge is just going to be the bridge. Whereas the water gives you all of these complexities and contingencies and difficulties to deal with, um, currents and crocodiles and who knows what else. Um, but it also gives you opportunities, the realness of that place. And so I'm wondering, in terms of the work that you're doing, what to do with that image, that instead of thinking, here's this community that thinks about food and agriculture in this way, and here's this other one, and how are we going to get from one to the other? What is it that's real about the space in between? And what are the, the difficulties, complexities, and opportunities when you're not just going from one place to another, but you're actually in a real space in between? Do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, that, let me respond first. Um, Naomi, I, I think um, what comes to mind immediately is politics. And what comes to mind is uh, this, um, this idea that um, there is, uh, uh, you know, they, the bridge, one of the things that I think that's implied by that is that, uh, uh, you know, there, there you're going from one particular place to another particular place, which has a certain kind of degree of fixity to it. Mm -hmm. And whereas um, 
you know, clearly what's needed is um, a, a negotiation that, uh, you know, identifies a way to go forward. And, and I should have said to Bill in response to his question, but one of the boundaries that I'm really interested in is between political groups that are not willing to engage in any kind of collective action with each other. And so, Naomi, um, the, you know, the river in some sense is a metaphor, I guess, for um, a, a situation in which uh, there can be um, negotiations and deliberations that possibly can arrive at something that's not a zero-sum game or, you know, not a carving up of the existing pie, but, you know, it has something generative about it. So I guess that's the way that I think of that, and I, and, and I guess I think of that as um, the kind of democracy, you know, that we're sort of trying to get to and to support. And there's not a lot of that kind of discussion, um, you know, anywhere in our society, but certainly in, in rural places, um, things are pretty polarized, you know, often between environmental and agriculture and you know, newcomers, et cetera. So uh, I guess that would be my response, is that, that I think it's, it's great, to, you know, that's, that's one of the things that the boat idea, I think, does point us out, and thank you for, for highlighting that. Well, and I think that, that you've already lost some people, which has benefits and problems once you're in the boat, because it's less secure. But I think once, once you can get into some level of that politics, I think the power relations are so often the thing that we don't have tools to grapple with. So, and that because we don't have the tools, people aren't willing to go there. So to be able to say, all right, you know, we're even really small things. So we're trying to figure out, this is a concrete example here. Minneapolis has just allowed a bunch of land to be, vacant land to be used for agriculture. And the, the PR version of this is that this is increasing food access to people. And then there are tons of really nitty gritty negotiations that have to be made about how much insurance do people have to be able to hold and what are all the barriers that, that have reasons for being there, but many of those reasons don't support the people who already don't have access to land. And getting people to be able to wade in and say, all right, why does this exist? Okay, yeah, but could it? So, so the negotiation at the moment was that they have the amount of insurance that was needed so that it's not probably the amount you'd need as a commercial farm, but as a backyard gardener, still making an important part of your family's <laughs> livelihood from the food you're then able to not buy. <coughs> like that maybe makes a big difference in someone being able to willing, being willing to front you that. And I think similarly, part of what's great about food and agriculture is field trips. You can get people out there seeing how the practices work and why you might be doing it differently than the way they thought was a good idea. But it's, I mean, I, I've been thinking in the back of my mind, well, what was that explosion about Kernza about? And I think it's partly it tapped into the wheat rust narrative. If you have never looked at the Stockman Borlaug archives, they are amazing. The University of Minnesota digitized them a couple of years ago. And they have these posters. It's like the red hand of fascism <laughs> stealing the wheat away from your children. And just like wild, like just extremely hysterical <laughs> propaganda that is lurking behind this barrier around like what rust will do to wheat. And that's a cool thing to unpack and to start being like, okay, why does this make you feel insecure about your livelihood? Because it's wheat rust is a real thing, but it's probably not fascism. <laughs> I smiled when you said wade in, because that's doing it without the boat. <laughs> that's, that's true. And you probably at least want like, you know, sanitizable rubber boots if you're trying to go into a wheat field, especially in Minnesota. So that's actually an interesting segue to um, something that I wanted to actually open up a bit more. We've been talking a lot about information and that actually intersected with the discussion of combines and the amazing data that you can actually gather now. Um, when you're out in the field. But what strikes me as interesting as a juxtaposition is that 
both psychologists and political scientists have been doing a lot of research around conspiracy theories, right? So red hand of fascism, but also conspiracy theories around vaccines, around GMOs, these sorts of things. And what they're finding is that all of that excellent knowledge that scientists are generating that actually comes off the combines really doesn't change people's minds. That in fact, people are much more likely to entrench in you know, the red hand of fascism belief or whatever it happens to be, or that you know, almonds are going to cause California to sink into the ocean. <laughs> so I'm wondering, you know, as you talk about information and outreach in these groups, where do you think there are potential inroads to actually push back against some of that? Is that the responsibility of, of groups and collectives like the ones where you're working? Um, have you had success with these kinds of efforts? Because that strikes me as one of the very real things that actually crosses political boundaries that affects the types of topics that interest you. Well, let me respond by talking about the way that we're trying to go forward around this Pennycrest plant mm -hmm. and the possibility of using these new genetic engineering techniques on it. And, and our plan is, which we're starting to carry out, is that what we really want to do is to um, have a, a pretty holistic uh, consideration or deliberation of what it would be like in the rural Midwest if people were to grow a lot of this pennycress stuff. And so, not only what would the environmental implications of that be, but how would the landscapes look different? How would the hydrology be different? What effects might there be on agricultural pests in general and on the soil? What kinds of new infrastructure would be needed to, you know, this would be sort of like, you know, we know that fracking has all these impacts. And you know, it would be kind of the analogous question in advance. And then the idea would be to say, well, okay, so how do we, as uh, you know, kind of a citizen jury, sort of, how would we decide uh, we feel about Pennycrest? And if, if we decided that Pennycrest was a terrible thing, then you know, presumably we would stop working on it. And if we decided it was going to be great just as it is, then we wouldn't have to use these techniques. But if we could imagine that with some tweaks, with some nips and tucks and so on, we would have a pretty good pentacress, then that would then be the stage to have a discussion about, you know, how worried are we about the, you know, the sort of, um, uh, you know, the sort of uh, collateral damage to the genome that these techniques cause, for example. And so that's our way of trying to wade into a hyper-polarized situation. Uh, uh, so, you know, the, the point, I guess, is, uh, you know, are there strategies that, uh, you know, really open the door to, uh, you know, a sort of collective construction of knowledge that uh, doesn't really... Uh, hinge on accepting, you know, any of the, the, the current bodies of knowledge that say GMOs are really fine or GMOs are, you know, have a lot of risk, but tries to construct some usable knowledge and then kind of take it from there. I don't know if that is relevant to what you were thinking. It's intriguing. Can mm -hmm. I take a stab at it too? And I, I really love to take a like, popular survey here. Does anyone read the children's horror books, Aberat, it's a three-part series. Clive Barker, all right, so the image here is, it's a inland sea that magically appears in the Midwest, and interesting stuff happens in the world if the boats wash up. Do you need children's horror stories? They're excellent. Um, and then the other, has anyone seen the film? I just showed it to Anthony Mead last night, Can You Dig This? Fantastic story. If you've seen Ron Finley's TED Talk on community gardening in South LA, Great. Anyway, so I see that I'm going to have to start slightly further back. So when you asked the question, my thought was that ship has sailed. And this is a this is a yes and. Like I I utterly think that this is important work, and spent three years working on it, and think that it that this 
Like we need to work on these nuts and bolts. At the same time, I think that pedagogically, we have we have failed wildly in our education system. And I think, so especially I, I find that political psychology line of research interesting because the other thing that goes along with that is that we're seeing increasing uh, polarization of society along the axes of egalitarianism and traditionalism. And agroecology is fascinating because those axes cut right through that. So agricultural communities um, tend to be have really interesting relationships with both traditionalism and egalitarianism, which are not related. Like they they differ depending on the contingent situations. Um, so I think one of the things that's the short version of this is that everyone has food experience. So I think that we actually kind of need to start over in some of our versions of this. I do a lot of work with K through 12 teachers trying to restart the way food experience is devalued in classrooms in favor of like, you know, nutritionists' food knowledge, which is often wrong. I mean, it's at least as wrong as what your you know, grandmother's food knowledge. And, um, and to build up a more civil rights kind of approach to everyone actually being important and everyone's health being important and not having that knowledge be so centered. So I've been thinking of this increasingly as the high tunnel school. So like taking a kind of high tunnel, you know, like looking at places like the Miles Horton and other populist literacy projects and saying, what is food literacy now? And where are the places that are less prone to that kind of inflammatory, propagandistic, often very in-group related, and how can we, how can we absorb all the resources. And one of the great models I've seen for this, slightly longer answers, Agricultural and Rural Convention 2020, it's an EU thinking beyond the farm bill of you know, common agricultural policy, has basically forbidden themselves as a platform, so 280 civil society organizations, from using scarcity language. And they like, scarcity language is where we run into all those problems. If we always train ourselves to what is the abundance language that can be used in that place, that we don't polarize it. Like we, we spend more time in the boat, unless at the bridge. That's old decision making literature. That's just framing. Right, but it's but it's not just framing. I mean, it's it's framing and framing that. Right. Oh, I was just going to ask a just general question about penny crust. Just the question: If you when you met with people like in Wyndham, when you talked to farmers, and you brought that word up, what was their what was their feedback? Just well, I, I wasn't present on Tony Thompson's farm in Linden uh, this summer for that conversation. We didn't bring up Penny Chris. Can't be as bad as Wheat Rust. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just bringing it up because it, I, I would guess there'd have to be a marketing type thing on it. Um, growing up in that area, because we grew up in Linden, because I live only like 20 miles north of there. Um, and knowing my brother-in-law is a farmer, and they just know how, how when you talk about politics, it's easy for us now that live in, since I live in the cities, um, how things work in the small town, <laughs> and how things get decided, and how things and choices get made, because everybody's interlinked, literally. I mean, you make decisions based on the fact of sustainability and the fact that you're not going to do something that's going to affect your family that you've known for how many years and make a choice in such a different direction. But at the same time, we're going to get back to this uh, plant. How does this affect an animal that might eat it? How does it, um, as far as I remember, it's related to the mustard plant. And the mustard plant was a very favorable plant. I remember pulling those out of the beans mm -hmm. before the GMOs came in. So I'm looking at you know generations of knowledge as you grow up of how you look at that plant, and then all of a sudden you now you're saying, hmm, it's a favorable plant. Um, <laughs> yeah. It, it's a very it, to me it would be something that uh, might take more generations to accept it be planted in a field. It seems like um, kind of both. And then I'm also looking as a person that's a gardener myself and how 
the marketing came into play how to accept as a gardener to put a piece of grass as a decorative plant in a planter because grass was not one of those things you always wanted to see as a favorable thing in your garden or in a planter. That took a lot of years before that was even accepted. So I'm just kind of curious because it's easy for people to think that things should go a certain way and read about it and if you live in the city and never lived many years and you can come upon a small town and make decisions it's more than just showing up and telling people. You have to um, build up a, a base of trust that you can't explain. It's not just the fact that you can tell them, you know, read this book, so and so, the, you know, you of my own extension says this. Um, it's Basically, I don't even know how to explain it, how much it's in the soul of what you're brought up with, and, it's, um, and I'm not a scholar of any means, but I'm more of a practical, practical thinker. <laughs> but I can't put the word of what it's more than just even beyond politics. Although it's not just beyond politics. <laughs> one, of, one of the things, there are a few pieces in there that I think are really interesting, because this relationship is really fraught between marketing and education. And I think that that is politics. And I think one of the things we often underestimate is how much money goes into huge marketing slash education, but mostly marketing, because they're not exploratory. They have a message, campaigns um, for fertilizer and input companies, and the, like creating an, an aesthetic that needs to be clean with a particular, anyway, I just, I think that part of what I've seen go amazingly well, and education in agricultural communities is people beginning to understand the way they have propagated racism and patriarchy in their classrooms by not thinking about whose knowledge gets stamped out, and often in those attempts to make trust. Um, so I think that, that these processes where people have to figure out how to talk with each other can are often difficult to scaffold in ways and support that people can can realize that they could have a conversation differently, but often extremely valuable. Well, the only thing I would say in response is I really appreciate your, your comments, and that's what we're trying to do, is we are trying to have a pretty wide-ranging conversation with a lot of different people contributing to it about this plant. And how do we really feel about the idea of there being a lot of this plant around? And, um, you know, people who, um, people who uh, object to the regulation of genetically modified organisms that we have right now often say it's unfair because we don't subject, uh, you know, other products of plant breeding to the same scrutiny. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. Adrian. Well, I just, I mean, I, I kind of thought both of those the comments on like how the knowledge that we feel like we're building makes it into people's heads were interesting because I, I so I was part of your, one of, one of the early cohorts of graduate <coughs> students uh, in this sort of discussion. And one of the big things that, to me, that, you know, that we were accomplishing was was sort of complicating in our in our own minds, like not you know going beyond being the the future agricultural educators who are banging our heads against the wall saying we know what to do why does nobody listen <laughs> you know and and I um, and I, I don't know that we came to conclusions exactly but it was valuable in realizing that that wasn't what we wanted <laughs> that you know that there had to be something more there to figure out and I've I mean I've been I, I was involved in organic agriculture and then came in as a, you know, as a graduate student and, and I've, you know, I have like neighbors and family friends and stuff who are very much in the, like, you know, who, who repost all their friends' things on Facebook about what's poisoning us today and, you know, all this stuff that, to, you know, to a lot of us it feels sort of conspiracy theorist and whatever, but, and then, and, and I see the, the sort of, the way that you can't just educate them, 
and out of people, nor would it be, is that really the goal? Uh, but at the same time, like a lot of a lot of those people then who know that I work in agriculture as scientists, they like sidle up to me at block parties and birthday parties, and they go, like, hey, I know this is kind of your area, even if it often really is not. What do you think about GMOs? Like, and and I try to tell people what I think, and I feel like you know it's not like everybody then adopts my views, but people are listening, and I feel like. You know, there, there is this this power in the capacity of a perceived expert who's your next door neighbor. Like, I don't have that power in any kind of formal educational capacity at all. Like, you know, there, I, I don't, and so it's sort of, and I don't know, if, you know, to keep going with the boat thing, it sort of feels like, you know, like the only, you know, like, like, you have to, somebody has to vote over to somebody else and ask that question, like, you know, you can't, like, there's not a way to just, like, do the education right and then that expertise will be recognized or something, I don't, I don't know. Part of the boat metaphor that I really like is you get in the boat potentially together and it's not like you're crossing the river, you're going down the river together. I think that's a, a way of thinking about the boat that is good. And Naomi, you were always talking about trust as this interesting part of validity, you know. And, I, and so being in the same boat together, you know, <laughs> strikes me as having that aspect too. And I think it, can I just say a really brief thing on the boat? I think that a piece of the, like, practice, the idea that part of what we do in education is give people a chance to practice things together is that you don't have to have agreed to figure out a practice where you could talk together and not feel betrayed. And I think one of the things that I guess that I find myself easily angered at with the marketing, and I, I notice this, and I, I don't want to cast aspersions, but it's definitely part of what happens in the education that particular commodity groups seem to forward for, I mean, and the Ag Ed Club, as much as I love them, those are the memes I get on things like social media that are like, don't talk to anyone else, they're wrong, don't trust them, and it's like an anti-practice of being able to have that conversation, and I, I find that as a, a scholar in trouble. I saw the boat at in. It seems like a fragile boat. I, I Oh, sorry. Well, I, I interrupted Harry, so okay. I, I would just, I, I know very little about any of this. You know, we do gardening in our backyard, and we you know, feel that it makes a lot of a difference in terms of how we eat and how our kids eat. But beyond that, I really, you know, know very little. But, so, having said that, I would love to hear a little more about your work on commercialization and your approach to commercialization because from the position of knowing little and having thought not a lot about this, I have a sense that well beyond what people know or think, prejudicedly or not, a lot has to do with what is available for them and at what price. And that that has to do with structures that are so well, so huge, so well beyond the farming. I mean, farming, yeah, too, but not just that. I mean, the whole sort of grocery business and government subsidies. And so, how do you even start making a dent there? Well, um you know, a, a little example of commercialization that I think is interesting is, do you know what cover crops are? Cover crops are things that you grow uh, during the time of year when you're not growing your quote-unquote main crops. So, corn and soybeans grow during the summer, the warm summer months, and, and otherwise often we don't have anything in the soil, which is a bad thing. And so cover crops are what you grow, too cover up the soil and put on erosion and feed all the living things in the soil and so on. And the, one of the big problems with them is that they're not commercialized 
In other words, they what they do is that they improve, they hold on to and improve soil, and that is something that is, uh, you know, the sort of um, economic value of that is, um, is you know, in a short term sense, is is very small. And so, um, uh, are you familiar at all with um, the Thousand Hills Cattle Company? They're a, a local, well, Midwest firm that provides grass-fed beef products to many co-ops and, and other places as well. And we've been talking to the person that started that, who's now moved on, about, um, about the idea of uh, grazing cover crops to produce, um, you know, one of the problems with grass-fed beef is there's not that much grass, you know, if you drive around farm country. But it's, it's actually really, really profitable to raise um, beef. You know, for people who we meet, uh, it, it's very profitable to raise beef from, uh, uh, you know, either from grass if you have pasture land. But um, so this person, uh, whose name is Todd Churchill, is very creative in his thinking, and he's not alone in thinking about this, but how do we develop schemes for, um, for enabling people to use their cover crops not only to feed the soil life, but also to feed um, livestock. And um, this is an example of a, you know, what would be called an alternative agri-food network or something like that, that you know, is a, a small and concrete example of sustainable commercialization. So we're, we're trying to you know, promote the growth of, well, it would be a good thing if more people, a lot more people grew these cover crops for a lot of different reasons. And um, so we think it's at least worth having a conversation about how could we, how could we get that going. And um, so, you know, that's an example. And I, and I think the, the moral of the story is trying to, not trying to compete with the industrial beef system that's based on feedlots and so on, but trying to find a way around that seems like it might have a big upside. And those upsides might be diverse. I mean, I think uh, urban analog is people have been trying to do the same kind of thing with cover crops to reduce the impacts of urban runoff. So to say that a multifunctional use of urban food land might be that it has uh, you know, nutrient-containing function so kind of creating, you know, part of what I think is really neat in these knowledge sharing domains is people trying to negotiate. So for example, the Hope Community and the Land Stewardship Project in Minneapolis have been trying to figure out, does this qualify, does it have the same kind of ecological functions as rain gardens for which people can get significant tax or you know, rebates on their water bills? And so that becomes, it's not exactly a commercialization, but it's a subsidy to be able to create um, land use. And I, and I think in some ways part of what I like is their domains, although I appreciate your qualifying what you know, like it's not not knowing anything. Like that's that's an impressive skill set and one I lack to be able to to grow food. And I think... And get your children to eat. And get your children to eat. <laughs> it's right. easier if you grow it yourself. Right. But yeah. being able to grow it yourself yeah. also a key it skill is. set. And um, you know, picking up you know, zucchini and eating it raw because he planted it and he picked it, you know. And go to grow. Yeah. I mean, we'll see I lack. But I think getting more people to feel like, right, they have skin in the game because they have some knowledge and wow, what if that knowledge could be respected as part of their livelihood? Not just because they were making a certain part of their income from, from farming, but they were contributing some values that everyone appreciates. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, I wanted to go back to a question that you kind of ended your first comment on, which is how would the GMO for the, uh, of the poor be? And it, it goes back and threading into ground that has been covered by many before. Bandana Shiva has talked about this at length with Rice. Um, uh, when I did some work in Oaxaca now, God, last century, right, where what was interesting was when I was an undergrad, we went to, uh, in the highlands of Oaxaca. Uh, to me, it was a great discovery because it was the first time I see it. But then we see this pattern happening all over the world. They did not that have a traditional non-industrial agriculture, that you save the best seed 
for the next crop. Then the second best seed is what you consume. And in the case in Oaxaca, the worst seed is what you took to the market. Therefore, if you had to go to the market to provision yourself, it's great moral shame, right? But these practices uh, all over the place have uh, brought about you know, improving uh, varieties, right? In the case of Oaxaca, it's corn. Uh, I just came back from a consulting gig with farmers in, well, he told you about this, in Haiti. And one of the big worries over there is that um, if, they, if they use their own coffee, this is coffee farms, to uh, create new uh, seedlings, that uh, it would introduce cross-pollination variations into this. They had to get the seed from uh, a reliable source, an approved source. And here's what we do, sort of, when we talk about, well, at least what I was thinking when you're talking about the GMO of the poor, which I know that hybridization is not GMO, but let's call it that for the sake of this. Mm -hmm. um, when we have this knowledge exchange and we, we, we as uh, academics, as uh, scientists or experts, you know, we basically translate this knowledge and we, we disseminate it. But that act of translation also um, kind of takes away that de uh, democratization. And I, I can't think of the Midwest of how we can go about democratizing this. One of the things in the, in the, in the, in the groups that I've been working with in, in Nicaragua and Haiti and East Timor is that there's this network that kind of um, is loosely bound to organizations like Via Campesina and others that are beginning to exchange knowledge on soil preservation, on uh, you know, uh, controlling erosion, uh, putting nutrients back in the soil, etc. But I just, I cannot imagine, you know, working against the the big ag corporations in the Midwest. Is this what you were more or less going in the direction of the GMO, the poor, or democratizing GMO? Yeah, and I think and so for those who weren't here when Juan Stone visited, the thought experiment was, well, it would be something that was vegetatively propagated so mm -hmm. that you avoided the risk of the control of the seeds, and it would be something that could be harvested when it was needed so that you avoided the predation of state taxation. You know, it, it had some of these, I think, great political, ecological intersections, and I think, I think that it's non-controversial at this point to say that the, the way that agriculture has concentrated and corporatized so that it feeds like it really benefits food processors and input suppliers in a disproportionate way at this point, mm -hmm. has really impoverished the, the knowledge systems around food and agriculture, but in ways that are recent. I mean, I was, I was sad Tracy had to get one of the things she often reminds us as a historian is these are recent and um, very contingent. A lot of things have had to be held tightly in place to keep the system working the way it does. And a lot of those alternative knowledge systems are still here. People exchange backyard seeds. I mean, I realize that that's, you know, it sounds like a small portion, but one of the things I always remind people is only 50% of the world's food is accounted for. We don't know where the other 50% of the world's come from because it's, it's that, I mean, you know this, it's the food that comes through the state and gets taxed. But all of the food that's feeding people in informal settlements, people are growing. So, so I think that I am hopeful, and I also think that the upper Midwest, for all of the corporatization we see, has very strong farmer-to-farmer -farmer networks. And this is one of you know, this is part of what's really exciting about things like Forever Green, like these urban networks where people are exchanging knowledge. And I think my aspiration for the baseball cardy thing I showed you is scaffolds, not, not only those questions, but as a way to get people to practice what are the tasks of translation so it can be more democratized? So it doesn't require a scholar or a mediator or a translator in the room. Or a development agency. Or a development agency, <laughs> right, right. But that they can be taken on. Yeah. Can I ask a smart added question? Um, you 
talk about all the usual boundaries, and I'm wondering about the unusual boundaries that need to be crossed here. And, and, and for one example, just the way we use the word democracy in this context, I find really troubling. And if you're talking about a humanities approach to that, there are critiques of democracy and history. Tracy's my friend. I mean, I'm not, you know. Um, I, know what, I know that the historical perspective is important. I'm a historian too, by the way. Um, but there's been a critique of the assumptions behind those, those things. So I'm asking you about the unusual boundaries and whether they may hold some space open to think about why the usual boundaries can't be crossed between, um, I'm thinking not about agriculture, but like, I'm thinking about EB and the boundary waters, right? You can't get the miners to talk to the environmental people because they have different ideas about commercialization. Um, boundaries, ordinary boundaries, regular boundaries. But so the bigger, where are the unusual boundaries that we have a hard time thinking about? Unless we take a, perhaps a more philosophical um, approach, a more critical philosophical approach to those democracy. Well, I guess my, my response would just be to say that I would say that we certainly in the Forever Green Initiative, um, those of us in it who, you know, kind of think about this issue or try to um, certainly feel that uh, democracy is a very problematic concept and that um, uh, the, you know, the importance of being critically reflective about what we do that we think is taking a democratic approach, quote unquote, we certainly see that as a necessity. I guess that's, I don't, beyond, you know, if, if you were to, to point out some of the things that you think are issues that I could perhaps talk about how we might think about those, but, but as a generic response, I think we're certainly trying to be critically reflective in our efforts to be democratic or to be part of something democratic. I don't know if you want to say more. I'll just put this in a little. I've been working with my students um, using the French regulation school's idea of convention theory and the way that different values are negotiated in relation to each other. And Chantal Mouche's work on agonism and the idea that, right, this, basically this idea of um, cooperation without consensus. Um, but especially working in the Twin Cities, and especially today, part of what has been really striking to me is a real shift away from a focus on democracy toward equity and toward uh, ecologies of repair. And especially in the food system, some of the most striking inequities and injustices. And, and I, I right, realize there are lots of ends means problems here. Like it's not that if you're working on these injustices, anything you do is good. But I think the disproportionate way in which people and development agencies kind of are the classic whipping boy for this, but of where people with good intentions come in and mess things up has now been so much part of what we think about that, that there really has been a shift toward negotiated process and thinking through how can this happen in a way that everyone is okay with with disproportionate power in this situation held by the people who haven't usually had power in these situations. And I, I recognize that that's a kind of, from a philosophical point of view, gross bastardization of democracy, but it, and, and I would say the food sovereignty movement, probably in the area we work, has had the most power in, in saying, there are certain ways to work that have to be understood at this point. And, and I don't actually know how much you had that up in one of your first slides, but is food sovereignty something Forever Green talks about explicitly? No. Is it, does it infuse it in any kind of background bag? Um, I think that the general idea that there needs to be governance of what we're doing that is um, much broader than is typical is is certainly something that is uh, a, a strong
strong premise down the line. But, um, you know, certainly the question of what that governance would consist of and how we develop it is um, very much a work in progress. But we are trying to be critically reflective about it, I will say that. Well, and I have to say one of the things that thrills me is that the current cohort, and I, I mean no disrespect to past cohorts, Andrew, for example, has been an awesome agri collaborative member, but there's an increasing number of people coming into graduate school to work on these kinds of issues from perspectives that, that recognize that these politics have to, and governance questions have to be part of what they grapple with. And there's a significant cohort right now, because I think this has been on my that ship has sailed rant. I think we have fallen down on incorporating the value of the liberal arts and the humanities and the understandings of how humans negotiate stuff into lab sciences miserably. And I mean, and this is something, this is certainly not something unusual here, but the urgency of food has often been used really perniciously to, to say we don't have time for that. And, um, and I think it's really hopeful that we have this moment. But I do think it's a moment, this is kind of a normative call out, where more of us could support faculty who have not felt that they have the tools. Like they don't know how to get in this boat. People who have been well esteemed in their fields and then suddenly they're being asked to think about governance and it's just like, one of my first experiences at that opening of the Stockman Borlaug Digital Archive, someone was like, ah, you're from the West Bank. And sort of stopped me. <laughs> and um, I was like, I, I had my little field notebook. I was like, I'm such an agronomy nerd. And um, was like, you think it's a distribution issue? I was like, I do think it's a distribution issue. That doesn't mean it's also not a production issue. And it just struck me, like, like just lying in the sand. And, and that's silly. And to be able to say, get over it. That's how you talk to me. On that note, I, uh, I think you get the last word. I want to thank um, Nick and Valentine and encourage everybody to reconvene upstairs on the first, on the fourth floor. Twice I've made that mistake. <laughs> fourth floor um, for the uh, event formerly known as a happy.